And uh, welcome everyone to AAA Houston section, Space Geek Speak. We meet every Saturday at this time. And uh, thank you for waking up or joining us earlier, depending on what, uh, what area of the world you are, because we have some of the members of a uh, uh, French uh, community. They joined us and uh, Douglas, uh, take a note because we have a sister section in uh, France. And uh, then uh, we have also from uh, from other areas of the world and United States. So thank you for taking your time and joining us today. We have uh, today a presentation from the figure in uh, the space exploration community, slightly different. It's not a human space exploration. And uh, nonetheless, it's uh, quite uh, fascinating. So with this, let me read the introduction for Dr. Hassan. Fellow space enthusiasts, it is with a great excitement that I am welcoming you to our Saturday Space Geek Speak meeting, featuring one of the most esteemed figures in the realm of astrophysics and space exploration, Dr. Hashima Hassan. Today, Dr. Hassan will take us on an extraordinary voyage from the iconic Hubble Space Telescope to the groundbreaking James Webb Space Telescope, sharing her personal journey through this monumental advances in space science. Dr. Hassan's career spent several decades at the forefront of space research and exploration with her deep involvement in both the Hubble and the James Webb missions, she offers us a unique insights into the evolution of space observatories, their technological advancements, and the profound impact they have on our understanding of the universe. As we traverse the timeline of this telescopic giants, Dr. Hassan will reveal not only the scientific milestones, but also the personal challenges and triumphs encountered along the way. Prepare to be inspired by stories of innovation, resilience, and the relentless pursuit of knowledge as Dr. Hassan unfolds her journey, which mirrors humanity's quest to reach further into the cosmos. With this, Dr. Hassan, it is my pleasure to welcome you to our forum. Uh, good morning, Svetlana and everyone else, and thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's really the honor and a pleasure for me uh, to address this distinguished audience and to share with you some of my personal experiences with this iconic uh, observatories. So uh, let me, if you allow me to share my screen, I have a few slides to help me with this uh, presentation. So let me start with, okay. I don't know how to get rid of this. Do you know how to? Maybe I can minimize it. Okay, here you go. Okay, so I call this presentation a tale of two telescopes, Hubble and James Webb. Uh, and uh, uh, as you all know, James Webb was launched in, on Christmas Day in 2021, a partnership between NASA and the European and the Canadian Space Agency and uh, Hubble Space Telescope, which is also a partnership with the uh, European Space Agency and Canadian Space Agency was launched in 1990. Uh, but before I speak of my uh, specific work with these telescopes, Svetlana wanted me to share a little bit about my background of how I got here. So my journey actually started in India in, in a town called Lucknow. And, uh, and I was, uh, you know, started my school very soon after India got independence. And there were very few uh, opportunities for uh, students, uh, for children to go to school and even fewer for, for girls. Uh, but I was fortunate to be in Lucknow and I went to a girls school. And uh, 
which was actually operated by Roman Catholic Irish nuns. Um, used to be for the British girls, but then uh, after independence, the Indian girls were admitted. It did not offer science, but again, I, I lucked out because uh, uh, when I was in the ninth grade, uh, uh, we got a new principal who had just returned from the USA with this revolutionary idea that girls could do science. So uh, our science was introduced. It was a challenge for us because it was hard to find women teachers, but somehow, uh, you know, uh, we were all very enthusiastic and uh, whatever teachers we did get were, were really good in uh, uh, giving us the background and getting quite often we just uh, studied by ourselves. Uh, so I completed high school. I went to, to Lucknow University and then decided to go for a master's in physics to Aligarh Muslim University. And there I uh, won a scholarship to uh, University of Oxford. And I w completed my PhD, they call it a DFL there, in theoretical nuclear physics. And then came back to India and did a postdoctoral work at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Bombay which at that time was the leading institute in uh, for uh, nuclear physics. And uh, then I <coughs> got, got a faculty position at the University of Pune. But at this time, uh, even my mother's patience was at, you know, had reached its limit. And she said, you've got to get married. And she found a husband for me. And I came to the United States. And found myself uh, in the uh, you know, forests and tobacco fields of North Carolina in 1979. Believe me, North Carolina was very, very rural. And uh, But fortunately, we were in an area which had uh, three good universities uh, and at uh, Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. And all of them were quite happy to have me come and work there. You know, uh, at that time, I couldn't even accept any money because of my visa situation. So I uh, started doing research work at Duke University. While there, I, <clears throat> I wrote a proposal to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and actually to the National Research Council to do uh, uh, work at the U.S. Environmental uh, Protection Agency, and I won that uh, fellowship. And uh, so I switched from uh, nuclear physics to environmental science. And then we went back to India. So I went back to nuclear physics. And then uh, again, we came back to the United States. And I found myself in Baltimore. And looking around, I found this new institute, Space Telescope Science Institute. And they were looking for someone to write the simulation software for the Hubble Space Telescope and its science instruments. And so they asked me if I would do that. And I said, well, why not? So that's how I got into Hubble. And uh, uh, I worked there from 1985. And then in 94, I joined NASA headquarters, first as a visiting senior scientist and then as a civil servant. So the road to NASA really took many turns. So at NASA, I worked as a program scientist on more than a dozen missions. The one in yellow are the ones I'm working on right now. I'm deputy on James Webb and, and uh, program scientist for New Star, XP, and uh, the NASA's partnership with WMK Observatory. And I have been program scientist for Hubble, so I threw two servicing missions for SOFIA, which is now retired, IUE, and you know, a lot of these uh, which are now uh, retired. So let's talk about Hubble. So as you all know, it's an iconic astronomical observatory which has spectacularly extended our understanding of the universe from nearby planets to the most distant galaxies. And these discoveries have raised new questions, tantalizing beyond its capabilities. And uh, so 
Uh, even before Hubble was launched in 1989, the scientists were thinking of what to do next. And I attended that conference in Baltimore and uh, they decided that uh, they needed a telescope which would continue and expand the legacy of the scientific discoveries from Hubble. And that's what eventually became the James Webb Space Telescope. So uh, James Webb is really a technological wonder, which is enabling humankind to unlock mysteries of the formation of the universe. It's a tribute to the ingenuity and creativity of uh, the human mind. And it's a 6.5 meter mirror, which, which is here on the left-hand side of this image. And it's for powerful science instrument. It is studying the first stars and galaxies, atmospheres of extrasolar planets, and helping us learn where elements that form life came from and much more. So uh, uh, both uh, James Webb and Hubble are a part of NASA's great observatories, the other two being Chandra, and, uh, which is an X-ray observatory, and Spitzer, which is now retired, which also observed in the infrared, uh, like uh, uh, Webb, but uh, with, a, uh, with a different wavelength range and a much smaller field mirror and field of view. So why do we need to observe uh, in different wavelengths? Because it expands our view of the universe. As an example, you can see on the upper left-hand side is a view of the Crab Nebula as seen by uh, Chandra and the X-rays take us right into the heart of the nebula. And this shows uh, uh, how the uh, uh, particles, uh, charged particles moved inside the nebula over a period of about 10 years. And the upper right-hand side is an infrared uh, image taken by Spitzer of uh, Zeta Oputi, a star. And you can see uh, the, uh, uh, the stellar winds blowing the, the dust into arc. And the lower left-hand side is a ring nebula taken by Hubble and in the visible, and it's showing a, a lot of details in the visible light. And the right -hand, lower right-hand side is a composite of uh, uh, in infrared, visible, and X-ray. And you can see the whole star formation cycle in here. So that's why it's important to see, uh, to view different wavelengths. And to view these, we have to go above the Earth's atmosphere. And for that reason, we send up space telescopes. So let's have a look back at Hubble. The bold vision for Hubble required it to be launched on the space shuttle. The these were the days of the space shuttle be serviceable by astronauts, and the science instrument to be kept current by changing them out during servicing missions. This is a Cassegrain telescope with a 2.4 hy hyperbolic primary mirror and a hyperbolic secondary, and the science instruments op operate in the UV, visible, and near infrared. On the right-hand side, you see a, a picture of a servicing mission. So, the Hubble primary mirror, a mirror, as you know, is the heart of a telescope. Uh, you can think of it like a, a, a light bucket, which uh, collects light. And the bigger and more powerful the mirror is, the you know, further we can see in time and more clearly. So the Hubble mirror is, is made of lightweight glass and has a honeycomb structure. Uh, it's an aluminum and magnesium fluoride coating, which is optimi optimized to reflect UV light. And it is the smoothest mirror ever ground. And the, but uh, the tragedy with the mirror is that the edges are ground to the wrong shape. So the Hubble mirror is flawed. And um, I found when I give talks that, that, that a lot of young people under the age of 40 don't even realize that the Hubble mirror is flawed, but it is. And when the first images came down, you can see on the left, they were blurred. So, so we, and we've and we analyzed these and we found that Hubble suffers from spherical aberration. Now, since I had written the software for Hubble, I was given the job to analyze these images and characterize the error so it could be, uh, 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 fixed. 
and additional uh, so and also to keep it in be in best focus uh, with the flawed mirror and but additional focus changes were introduced by water desorption from the graphite epoxy truss supporting the mirror and there's a picture on the right hand side of the gra graphite epoxy truss which supports the mirrors so it was known that in space graphite epoxy desorbs water which will cause it to shrink uh, but uh, there were two things we, we didn't know. One is that, you know, when when the mirror was flawed, even a small bit of shrinking really changed the focus quite a lot. And the other thing was we didn't know how long and how much water would be dissolved. And it, it turned out it dissolved much uh, longer than uh, uh, had been theoretically predicted. So I was made the telescope scientist, and it, it was my job to uh, keep monitoring the focus of the telescope. And every time, you know, the mirrors became too close because the water desorption, uh, I had to send a message to Goddard, which was the uh, operation center for Hubble, to move the mirrors so that it would come back into the best focus that uh, we had defined. So here is, uh, you know, the my publication on the telescope image modeling software and on the focus history of the Hubble Space Telescope. And that's me in, as an instrument science, telescope scientist at uh, Space Telescope Science Institute. And then uh, I think we all know that the Hubble optics was fixed during the first servicing mission uh, with the Co-star, which is the corrective optics, uh, uh, placed in a, in, in a box. And there were little mirrors in there which deployed in front of each of the science instruments and with corrective optics so that the light which reached the instruments was uh, corrected for aberration. And the new instrument, the wide field uh, uh, planetary camera, uh, was in that the... Uh, uh, correction was made within the instrument. So here's the servicing mission where CoStar is being in installed by the astronauts. So this was our success story, before and after images with the faint object camera and here with the wide field and planetary camera too. So this is how we overcame this uh, uh, issue. And of course, the story is very long. I've given it to you in a few minutes. And the Hubble orbit is around the Earth at an altitude of uh, about 554, uh, 545 kilometers. Its orbit is inclined with respect to the Earth's equator, and it zooms in its orbit at a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour, which means it completes an entire orbit in just 97 minutes. So here's the timeline of discoveries. You can go and have anyone interested can go and have a look at it. And uh, as we all know, Hubble has been doing incredible science. I've just selected a few here for you to see, show the science through the ages. Um, the Eagle Nebula, which was named the Pillars of Creation. It was just, uh, you know, blew, blew the mind of everyone uh, scientists as well as the public and became an iconic image for Hubble. And then the frontier field in 2017, 2013, gravitational lensing uh, was, uh, was uh, used to determine dark energy. We did not know that there was something called dark energy and using Hubble data, scientists uh, found dark energy and that led to a Nobel Prize. And um, in 2022, Hubble observed the furthest star ever seen, uh, the Arundel, Arundel star. And it even saw uh, the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. When Hubble was launched, we didn't even know there were extrasolar planets. But by 2008, Hubble had found uh, methane in the atmosphere of an extrasolar planet. And just recently, uh, these two images, uh, one in, in the middle at the bottom and one on the right, these were uh, released Hubble images showing cosmic dust 
dust lanes in, in, in a, a galaxy, and on the right, a triple star system, which is forming right now. So it's a very young system in the state, stage of formation. So Hubble is just continuing to do spectacular science. So uh, James Webb is a Hubble's scientific successor. So it's building on what uh, Hubble is, is doing. And it's, I, I would say a lot of the science is complementary to Hubble and it's going beyond Hubble. So it's really looking, both of them are looking back in time and that because the light arriving at Earth from the furthest objects uh, left those objects billions of years ago. And we see these objects not as they are today, but as they uh, appeared a long time ago. And this is actually pretty much true for any telescope or even with our eyes, you know, the uh, light that left the sun was about eight minutes ago. So uh, the universe started when a singularity which contained the entire mass and energy of the universe suddenly started expanding in a phenomenon called Big Bang. And as the universe expands, the light in the universe stretches to a longer wavelength. We call that the cosmological redshift. So uh, Webb is designed to study every phase in the history of a universe, starting from what the astronomers call the end of dark ages, uh, when the stars were formed and uh, light started, you know, uh, escaping um, the assembly of galaxies, births of stars and planets and uh, uh, planets in our own, the outer planets of our own solar systems, as well as other solar system exoplanets and the very beginning of life. So where specialization is in the infrared. Um, as you know, the visible is a very small part of the infrared spectrum, and Hubble observes in the uh, visible, in the uh, near uh, in infrared, and and the near ultraviolet. And uh, Spitzer, which is now retired, observed in the uh, from the mid infrared to the far infrared, and James Webb covers the in between ground from near infrared to mid infrared with a much larger uh, mirror and which much greater sensitivity and field of view. So why do we want to observe in the infrared? Because, uh, because uh, uh, that's because the light which left the first stars and galaxies as UV and ultraviolet started stretching as the universe expanded. And so that light has now stretched and reached into the infrared. So if you want to observe the first lights and uh, stars and galaxies, we need to uh, observe it in the infrared. Uh, in addition, Webb can also peer through and examine dust. So that's the power of infrared and is demonstrated here from with Hubble and Spitzer images. On the left, you can see those pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula in um, a visible light uh, uh, the, uh, that's absorbed by the dust and you can't see what's behind those pillars. But in, in the middle picture, again, a Hubble picture in the near infrared, the infrared light from, from the newborn stars penetrates uh, the dust. And so you can start seeing those stars which are being born behind those dust pillars. And the right is in the mid infrared, which is the cooler light emitted by the dust pillars. So you can see how the dust pillars are dissolving with the heat from the new by, newborn stars. So th these different uh, uh, wavelengths of light show you different parts of the whole story. Infrared light also helps us find distant planets because uh, planets are cool and they uh, em emit uh, light in the infrared. In this picture on the right is actually from the Keck telescope in Hawaii, and the star has been blocked off with something called a coronagraph, and you can see the planets, uh, extrasolar planets behind it. So web science, it's done again, like uh, Hubble's doing a whole lot of science. I'm just showing a few demonstrative ones here. Uh, the one uh, on the left side, the Rho Opuchi, is a star-forming region. And uh, so uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, later. Uh, then in the middle is the is a 
showing a merger of black holes. This is a very recently, it was this result was just released uh, earlier this week. On the right hand side of the famous Eagle Nebula seen by Webb, and you can see, um, uh, uh, you can start seeing through the dust over here and see star formation. Middle is an aurora on Jupiter. And then on the lower left hand side is an extra uh, atmosphere of an extrasolar planet where uh, uh, one thing really exciting about is that dimethyl sulfide was seen for the first time on an extrasolar planet, which is a sign of uh, uh, life. So, uh, and then in the middle is a uh, uh, Cassiopeia A, which is a supernova remnant. On the right is the uh, um, deep field, which was released by President Biden as one of the first images released from uh, Webb. So um, let's look at one star forming region. I mentioned Rho Beauty. Uh, I thought I had a... a, a slide on that, but I don't. So just let me tell you a little bit about Rho Beauty over here on the left-hand side, you see the dark side, uh, the dark part is where there's a lot of dust. So even the infrared light is not penetrating in from it. And, and the uh, red streaks we are seeing on the side are the illumination uh, illuminated by young stars is, is hydrogen, which is emitted as the young stars uh, burst out of their cocoons of dust. And on the left-hand side, uh, the, is uh, this white, uh, whitish uh, uh, material is, uh, uh, which is surrounding the bright, brightest and heaviest star in, in this uh, uh, region, it contains uh, hydrocarbons which are uh, uh, called polycyclic hydro hydrocarbons, which are the uh, greatest uh, mole uh, the, the molecules found in, the, in space in the largest number. Here's a picture of the Horsehead Nebula and uh, the picture in the top, uh, you know, the thumbnail on the top is uh, the Horsehead Nebula taken by Hubble. And the ones on the side are uh, the top part of what is called the main of the horse. So, so that has been taken by Webb and they're shown on the left-hand side. And you can see the top image is in the mid-infrared or the MIRI, MIRI instrument and the bottom is the near-infrared with the near-cam instrument. And so the UV light from the young massive stars creates a mostly neutral, warm, area of dust and gas between a fully ionized gas surrounding the massive stars and clouds in which they were born. And this is known as a photo dissociation region. And the UV radi radiation strongly influences the chemistry of these regions and acts as a significant source of heat. And the mid-infrared light captures the glow of substances like dusty silicates and soot-like molecules. I mentioned earlier the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And the color that has been given here to these images, of course, uh, as you know, we can't see infrared uh, light with our eyes. So uh, uh, the images have been given uh, false colors so we can see them. So in the upper image, the colors blue, green, and red represent wavelengths going from 5.6 microns to 25, so from hotter to cooler. And in the lower is the near infrared image. Here, the clouds are represented by blue at the, at the bottom of the image. Uh, they are filled with materials, including hydrogen, methane, and water ice. And the red color whisks represent atomic and molecular hydrogen. And this area is composed mostly of neutral warm gas and dust between the fully ionized gas above and the nebula below. And again, the colors from blue to red represent uh, going from hotter to cooler. Uh, so those, that was one example of star birth. Here's an example of star death. Uh, a wolf ray star, this is a very massive star, which is in the throes of death. And the nebula structure uh, is created by material cast off from the aging star and is displayed by the glow of the cooler cosmic dress in the mid infrared. And the image on the right is a mid infrared image taken by Miri. The one on the left is a composite of the near infrared and a mid 
uh, uh, near Cam and, and Miri image. So this brilliant stage of mass loss precedes the star's eventual su supernova when the nuclear fusion and its core stops and the pressure of gravity causes it to collapse in on itself and then explode. And Webb will help astronomers to explore questions that were previously only left to theory about how much does stars like this create before exploding in a supernova? And how much of that dust is large enough to survive the blast and go on to serve as building blocks of future stars, planets, and complex molecules? So those were a couple of examples of uh, star birth and death. So now let's look at some galaxies. So uh, there's a survey called uh, Sears, Cosmic Evolution Early Release Survey. And this is, again, a result which has recently been released, where res researchers examined galaxies that are estimated to exist between when the universe was 600 million to 6 billion years old. And the galaxies in the universe are often flat and elongated. And this came as a surprise. You know, they're more like surfboards and pool noodles, and they are rarely round like volleyballs and frisbees, which is what had been the belief before we saw these images. And these uh, distant galaxies are also far less massive than nearby spirals and ellipticals. So these are precursors to more massive galaxies like our own. So here is a video uh, 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 of uh, of a uh, deep field, which is every second of it is uh, 200 million years going back in time. <laughs> so you can get an idea of how the galaxies evolved. So you can see the, the ones which are closer in our time were more evolved and had structure. And as we go back in time, uh, they, are, they are less structured and they start looking like those uh, uh, paddles and pool noodles that we've seen in the new images. And they and so are almost structureless. And so the, <clears throat> the last galaxy that we will see is called Macy's Galaxy, and that was like 390 million years after. Uh, after the Big Bang. So you can see there's very little structure there. Uh, how do I go to? Okay. So direct impact is also a, a lab for star formation. And the image on, on the right, you see that uh, the galaxy on the right has gone through the galaxy on the left and it's created, it almost looks like a splash in a pool. And uh, it has, uh, the the ring around is the it's created new stars are being formed and again in this image the blue dots are individual stars or pockets of star formation and this image is uh, 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 again a composite of a near cam and a miri image and the near cam data uh, reveals the difference between the smooth distribution or shape of older star populations, uh, which are in the core of the galaxy, and compared to clumpy shapes associated with younger star populations outside it. And the MIRI data, which is colored in red, reveals regions which are rich in hydrocarbons and other chemical compounds. And, uh, 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 as well as silicate dust. And these regions form a serial, series of spiraling spokes that essentially form the galaxy's skeleton. So um, this is uh, just showing how, you know, direct impact can also cause uh, uh, star formation. This is again a result which was released just, I think, a couple of days ago, where hints of atmosphere have been observed by Webb around a super Earth exoplanet called 55 Ancre. And here the spectrum shows that the planet may be surrounded by an atmosphere rich in carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide and other volatiles, not just vaporized uh, rocks. So the red uh, curve is, is a model of an emission uh, spectrum if the planet had 
only rock vapor. And the blue is a is a planet with a if the planet has a volatile atmosphere, and and so uh, and the dots are the data for carbon dioxide or carbon monoxide. So this is a, another very new exciting result. And this purple is MIRI data, and uh, yellow is near cam data. So uh, Webb has also observed uh, all our outer planets, and I'm just showing you one example. This is the view of Uranus, uh, ringed world. The Webb image exquisitely captures Uranus seasonal north uh, polar cap, including the bright white inner cap and the dark lanes in the bottom of the polar cap. And the Ur Uranus's dimmer Dim inner and outer rings are also visible in the image, including the elusive zeta ring, and the extremely, which is the extremely faint and diffuse ring closest to the planet. This web image also shows nine of the planet's 27 moons, and these are the blue dots that surround the planet's rings. So, but uh, I hope you'll go on, on to the web and see uh, the images for the other planets. So I'll pause here for a second to see if there are any questions on the science before I go to the engineering of the telescope. Svetlana, would you? There, uh... Yeah, there, there are a couple questions right now posted. So one is uh, from uh, Esther. She, she asked, how could infrared light also be used to find uh, host stars or just exoplanets? Yeah, yes, it can. Uh, so uh, I, I not only cool stars, but has also observed brown dwarfs. And uh, if I had a, more time, I'd have shown you uh, brown dwarfs. We can dwarfs. do it next time. It's OK. Uh, yeah. the, the more uh, more information on that, but you can answer the question. Yeah. Yes, uh, I have a couple of questions, but I will ask uh, and uh, ask after the presentation. Okay, okay. So let let me go and and give you a quick glimpse. I've given you a glimpse of the science. Let me give you a glimpse of the technology. So uh, this is a mission led by Goddard Space Flight Center, international uh, collaboration. Uh, I've mentioned earlier. The prime contractor was Northrop Grumman Space System and the science instruments to so the near cam, which I've already mentioned, there's a, a near infrared spectrograph provided by ESA, a mid infrared instrument partnership between NASA and ESA, fine guidance sensor and near I I imaging slitless spectrograph, NIRIS, provided by the Canadian Space Agency and the operation centers at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore. So this is a deployable telescope. Uh, you know, it's uh, in uh, the mirror as, as I'd shown earlier, and I, I have another video of it, a false bag composed of 18 pieces. And uh, uh, this was actually modeled after the, the big, uh, uh, segmented mirror at the Keck Observatory in Hawaii. Uh, so it has to be kept at cryogenic temperature because uh, since it's an infrared telescope, it, we do not want background radiation. Everything we know, uh, your, everything emits infrared, uh, your body, uh, the telescope. So uh, if, if you keep it cool, then uh, its own heat will, will not interfere with the infrared light it's observing. So, the, so to keep it cool, there's this five-layer sun shield uh, made of Kapton. And it was launched on a uh, ESA-supplied Ariane rocket from the French Space Agency. It was designed to be a five-year mission with a 10-year goal, but in fact, we are expecting the fuel to last for 20 years. So it will, uh, it, it should be now a 20 year mission. So it is really a feat of engineering and uh, there were uh, um, a lot of new technologies, but I will talk about two of them. But first I'd like to mention about the primary mirror, because as I said earlier, 
that a primary mirror is the heart of the telescope. So you can see how powerful it is just by comparing the sizes of the mirrors. The Hubble mirror is 2.4, Spitzer was only 0 0.85, and the JWST mirror is 6.5 meters. So when the astronomers uh, told the engineers, we want a big mirror, the engineers took up the challenge they had to think of how to make a 6.5 meter mirror which would fit into the fairing of available rockets. And the way they thought of doing it was to find a mirror which could be folded. So the design is that there's an elliptical primary, hyperbolic secondary, elliptical tertiary, and a flat a fine steering mirror. And uh, so it's an and astigmat, and the 18 primary mirror segments, six degrees of freedom, brilliant mirrors, 40K operation, polished to the correct shape and cold, and long lead item was the fabrication. So just let me say a little bit about the mirror. Uh, it's, um, the, uh, it's the three properties of beryllium, which are important for this mirror, is the low coefficient of thermal expansion, because we don't want the mirror to change as the temperatures change, high thermal conductivity, conductivity and stiffness to mass ratio. And uh, uh, the primary mirror properties are also that uh, it's 21.8 uh, kilogram uh, substrate, the segment assembly, 39.4, and compared to Hubble and Keck, uh, it's really very much lighter. And here on the right-hand side is the actual si size of a segment. Uh, and I think this is probably at Marshall. I'm not sure where it is. And on the left-hand side uh, at the bottom is a polished segment. This is a video which is showing the uh, the assembly of the mirror into the back plane at uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, where uh, each plane was, uh, each segment was robotically placed into the back plane. And of course, this is a time lapse image, but the, the actual installation of the mirror. The audio is just some music. I know you can't hear it, but. It's quite fascinating seeing, you know, how one at a time the mirror segments were placed. So while this is going on, I just want to mention that the parts of the web were built all over the country, and not in just one place. Here's the fully assembled mirror. And why do I not? Uh, I'm not sure I'm not being okay. So here I am standing in front of the fully assembled mirror, seen through the viewing window. Uh, all the uh, you know uh, families and uh, people working with web were invited to come and view this mirror and get a beauty shot with it. So then the other technology, as I said, which I wanted to mention was the five layer sun shield with an SPF of a million. And you can see on the hot side, it goes, it's at 185 degrees Fahrenheit. On the cold side is minus 388 degrees Fahrenheit. So the big difference and that's the reason they put it in five layers and they have different uh, coatings on, on on the layers too. the outer one had to be uh, which gets a direct sunlight uh, ha has i forget what the actual coating is yes it's silicon 
coated with silicon on the sun side and aluminum on the others. And here is a vi video showing the engineering, uh, uh, the, the engineering uh, um, uh, model of the uh, sun shield. So again, this is a time lapse uh, video where they're testing the sun shield, the material, and to see if they can stretch it and then separate uh, the five layers. And this is at Northrop Grumman in California. So after stretching them all, they, they then separate out each of the five layers. There you are, this is the engineering model, and that was the manual deployment. And here is the fully assembled uh, uh, telescope and, uh, you know, and the sun shield integrated into the sun shield. And here it was ready to be sent off for launch. And here is, is a cartoon showing how it was folded back and placed into the nozzle of the launch vehicle, which is on the left-hand side. You can see that sitting on top of the rocket. And so it was launched from Kourou in French Guiana uh, to uh, uh, L, uh, point L2 point, Lagrangian point two and had 40 deployable structures and 178 release devices. And each and every one of them had to work, it could not fail. This is just showing where the areas of specialization of the different science instruments is. And these are, for anyone interested in the uh, technicalities, these were, uh, were the, uh, science requirements, uh, near CAM is wide field deep imaging, near spec is multi-object spectro spectroscopy, a very interesting uh, technology in here is a micro shutter array where there are little windows which open up depending on what the astronomers want to do. Um, that technology was actually developed at Goddard and then it's been put into uh, near spec. Then MIRI does mid-infrared imaging and spectroscopy, and FG Nairus is fine guidance center, as well as near, it's a splitless spectrometer. And you can see the wavelength ranges of these. So here are the actual instruments, the near CAM, the near SPEC, the MIRI, and the FGS Nairus. So uh, these were the new technologies which were demonstrated in 2006. And these had to be developed before uh, web uh, uh, could be uh, you know, built. The near infrared detectors, sun shield material, primary mirror segment, mid infrared detectors, cryo ASICs, micro shutter arrays, heat switches, uh, uh, the large precision cryogenic structure, wave front section and control, cryo coolers. So you can see these were all completely new technologies. So to give you an idea why it took so long to do this mission. This, and nurse, read, this is the read, launch, six, during the launch. Thank Cap, three, two, unité, top. And we have engine start. And liftoff. Decollage, liftoff from a tropical rainforest to the edge of time itself. James Webb begins a voyage back to the birth of the universe. This was the actual launch. And this is the picture taken from the uh, a rocket after it deployed web. So this is the actual picture, actual web. And this is just a video showing how web deployed in space. So first, you know, the high gain antenna comes out, the, uh, you know, the solar array, then the <coughs> primary mirror, and, and then the, uh, you know, the sun shield starts unfolding. 
and uh, after it unfolds, the layers, five layers will separate. And And then the primary mirror, no, then the secondary mirror deploys, yeah. After this, the secondary mirror will deploy. There you go. And then the primary, and then the telescope is ready for observations. Ah, oh, sorry. Okay, so where is Webb? So Webb's orbit is as, as at uh, Lagrangian point L2, which as you know, is a semi-stable point. And so it orb orbits the sun uh, like Hubble, which or orbits the earth. Uh, this orbits the sun as L2 orbits the sun. And <clears throat> uh, it's always faces, you know, the sun is uh, the, uh, the sun shield faces the sun, so the telescope is always cool. And this is a million miles from the Earth. So this is uh, an, a, an ideal point for, for the telescope for making its observations. And it's not far enough th that it can't communicate. And there are other telescopes also at this point, L2. This is not the only one, but it's, it's a good place for telescopes. So Webb's commissioning took about six months because after launch, the mirror deployments took place, uh, as I showed you, that was uh, um, uh, in that video. Then it arrived at L2. After that, it took a few months to cool down. And then the alignment was done at Space Telescope Science Institute. Institute. Instruments were calibrated. And then the first images were released in July of 2022. This is a video showing the actual alignment of the web, where, where a star was acquired in each of the segments, and then each segment was uh, uh, aligned. And then after that, uh, the images in each segment were stacked to get the one single perfect image. And then Webb was re ready for observations. So this was the image, which was the actual alignment image of a star in the Milky Way, which was released on March 11. And then this was, <clears throat> you know, the sh image sharpness test in each of the instruments. This was, uh, you know, after each of the instruments had been aligned, and then Web, Web was ready for science in April of 2022. And th these are the first release images, which are, everyone has seen. And anyone interested in analyzing Web or Hubble data, please go to Mikulski Archives of Space Telescope. And all the data is public. Anyone can analyze web data, Hubble data, test data, you know, all our uh, data is there in public archives. And I'll end on a personal note. On the left-hand side, I am with Nancy Roman called the mother of Hubble and Nobel laureate John Mather, who was the project scientist of web and actually, uh, when I was, uh, as soon after I joined uh, NASA headquarters in 95, uh, at the end of the fiscal year, I went to Ed and asked him, you know, I had some money left in my budget. And so he said, send it to John Mather to study the next generation space telescope. So that's what Webb was called first, NGST, Next Generation Space Telescope. So that was really my first start on NGST. And then later on, I was NGST program scientist and web program scientist. And then I became web deputy program scientist as I took on other responsibilities. And then on the right-hand side, I'm with Charlie Bolden, who was the NASA administrator. And he was the astronaut who took Hubble up the, the first time. So with that, I will end my presentation and stop sharing my screen. Okay. Are we open to questions? 
Svetlana. Uh, Dr. Kumar, can you wait? I have a couple questions first. Okay. To ask, and uh, then uh, we'll follow up with everyone on the that is on the meeting right now, and so that would be your chance to ask a question. So I will start with uh, I have two questions from uh, Rock, and then uh, we'll follow with uh, uh, John Deloria question, and then I don't see any others posted. So that would be your cue for your questions. And first, I wanted to say thank you, Dr. Hassan. This was a great presentation, and I am looking forward to learn even more from the following interactions. So with, the, with this, uh, Rock asked, uh, first question is, uh, how prominent are the effects of the micrometeorite impact that Webb suffered earlier in the mission? So uh, there was only one of those which would be kind of significant. Uh, the others were small enough that, that they didn't really have too much impact. But, but the one which was kind of biggish was happened to be at the corner of one of the mirrors and it can be removed in image processing. Okay, thank you. And the second question is, uh, what is your opinion on the debate of sending a flagship telescope to orbit versus constellation of smaller telescopes that work together, like a swarm? Yeah, so uh, a, a big telescope, of course, is an observatory, as you can see, which gives a lot of opportunities to do big science. Smaller ones we send to do targeted science. And, and we take advice from the National Academy, which, which has recommended uh, a balance between the large and the small. And so, of course, we then have to look at the budget that Congress gives us. And so each has its value, and we try and uh, balance the two. Okay, thank you. And uh, doc, uh, the John Deloria asks, uh, has uh, Dr. Hassan reviewed or compared other photographs going back in time, say 385,000 years ago, and, uh, or how far back can we see? So far, uh, I think we have seen galaxies which were about uh, 500 or 400 million years after the Big Bang. So that would be like 13 point, I don't know, 2 billion years back from now. Okay, so it's definitely further than uh, John uh, had uh, pointed. Okay, well, thank you. And Dr. Kumar, this is your opportunity. Uh, first of all, I feel so fortunate, Svetlana. Thank you so much. Dr. Hassan, uh, I am so fortunate to be uh, in audience and, and listening to your presentation. It gives me so much happiness. And uh, just as a part of humor, luck now, you come from luck now. Actually, it is fortune now, luck now. So you are very fortunate uh, at what you are doing and you have achieved a, a great lot. Just a capsule thing about me. I served uh, space, uh, particularly NASA for 54 years. Here's how. Four and a half years through university, six and a half years through Lockheed, then about 43 years directly as civil service employee. And I was for 22 years ST, ST, you know what grade that is, and ST, Senior Scientist for Technology Investigation here at Johnson Space Center. My only passport to what you are talking today is twofold. One, uh, that I was a member of Sensor Working Group for NASA, and we got highly commended by the, oh, by the administrator. Uh, oh, oh. What happened? Keep on talking. We can see. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm glad uh, I can't see on my thing. Highly, we got highly commended by 
the administrator for, uh, on the sensor working group. We were working on the legacy instruments that eventually found their way one way or the other, at least the technology wise in uh, Hubble and Webb telescope. The other interaction I had was through superconducting super collider where I was serving as the point of contract from NASA and Dr. Aaron Cohen, the director here at Johnson Space Center said, Kumar, you're gonna give me a presentation on this. And so I was baffled for six months <laughs> trying to catch any uh, astrophysicist uh, and Nobel laureate to teach me about the universe. Now, here's my question. My question is, are we learning anything about time and space? I'm particularly interested because uh, kids, you know, I give a lot of presentations on technology that we worked on all these years and Kids, little kids from high schools and so on and so forth ask this question. Now, what, where did time come from? Where did space come from? About the time, particularly, nothing can happen without time. So how, do we have any clue at this time how time came about? Of course, space even really excites me because if you go outside the universe, you will find more universes in my humble way of saying. But after that, where does the space end? I'm done. Yeah, I don't think we have an answer to that yet. Mathematicians have proposed a lot of things, as you said, that uh, multiple universes and so on. Uh, but observationally, this is the only universe we know about. And the Big Bang is just a theory, as you know. So we, we, with our observations, that theory is based on observations. And so for, uh, you know, and the concept of time has been invented by human beings. And so th that time began at Big Bang. Well, th that is where my problem comes. And I asked Nobel laureates, uh, I don't yeah. want to leave them, but none of them can answer this. Well, the Big Bang, here, here is my problem. See if I make sense. The Big Bang could not have happened unless we gave it 10 to the power minus 50, whatever seconds huh. happened. Right. Where did that come from that made that Big Bang happen? Anything that happens, uh, that's has to a, have the ingredient of time. That that's a, a a very deep philosophical and fundamental question. And yes, you're right. We don't have an answer to it. I I have written a paper. I, 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 I I'm I, in good company if, if if Nobel laureates couldn't answer it, and I'm not. Yeah, I'd okay. love to see your paper. Send me a reference. I, I have a uh, I wrote a paper. I have no time on understanding I have no time. I want to send you how the ancient thoughts that expressed a lot about time. Yeah. It is fascinating, I will send you. I'm sure a lot of people have thought about it. So I'm, putting I'm sure that that would be the goal fashion. and purpose of future investigation and uh, it is as uh, Dr. Hassan said it is a very deep and very philosophical and uh, a lot of uh, great minds are thinking most likely about that too so thank you Dr. Dr. Kumar and uh, Dr. Hassan shared her uh, her email so if you would like to send uh, your paper or further questions that would be appreciated uh, can you send that to me, her email? I will definitely send her the email. I will. Uh, the mm -hmm. That I uh, researched for more than 30, 40 years of okay. my life. Because I was oh, fascinated. Yes, absolutely. I will, I will send. I have a few other questions that uh, following up. Uh, so if you can um, let me ask. Cindy asked, would it be valuable for a telescope to operate on the far side of Earth's moon? 
Yes, um, uh, several astronomers have actually proposed uh, doing radio astronomy because there'll be no interference, uh, you know, from uh, radio on on this side of the moon. So, so certainly uh, that's an ideal spot for radio astronomy. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. One one more question from the audience, and uh, feel free to either unmute yourself or post in the in the chat, and I will read. Rock asked, "What is the, your opinion on proposed Hubble? Oh, Hubble, sorry, pardon me, Hubble reboost mission, like Polaris and other proposed concepts. Are they worth it, or would it be better to allocate those funds toward development of the next generation space telescopes?" Yes, yeah, so, so that's always, uh, uh, you know, what we juggle with, that um, do we continue operating the current telescopes or do we uh, shut them off and uh, uh, go to, new, uh, to, to the new ones? And the process that we have at NASA is, or certainly in astrophysics, we do every, I think, about four years, something called a senior review. Where, where we get all the missions to send in proposals and those are reviewed by the by a committee and uh, they then um, advise us on uh, wh whether it's worth uh, keeping this mission going or not. So I think some of uh, that really plays into whether we pay for a Hubble reboost, is it going to give us so much more science than any new mission will give? then maybe that's what we should be investing it in. But if we find, if the committee, you know, gives us that now Hubble has now passed its life. So it'd be great if it keeps going, but reboosting is not really not going to do. I mean, it's, its instruments are also old. It's, uh, you know, gyros are, are dying. So all those things are taken into account. Thank you. Is there any other questions from the audience? Uh, Dr. Hassan, are we using superconducting material for any of this technology, any of these uh, space telescopes, superconducting like, you know, superconducting I, I, material? Yeah, I, I'm thinking, I think the detectors might have, uh, we might be having superconducting detectors. I'm not 100% sure, but... I know that we've done a lot of uh, research and development in superconducting detectors for astronomy. Thank you. Uh, I can uh, give some information on the Ariane 5 launch of uh, the JWST. We had special requirements. One was about the cleanliness. The cleanliness requirements were even more severe than for a geostationary telecommunication satellite. And the other one was about the extremely stringent uh, pressure differential requirement in order not to damage the super insulation. And the fairing of Ariane 5 was modified to enable a venting in order to have this requirement fulfilled. Yeah, thank you. That's great information. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? If no other questions, I have a few questions. I have a lot. I have a lot, but <laughs> my main hang up is what I face when I go to give talks on space. And that is, what is the origin of all this and where are we going? Well, that the telescope may not necessarily answer that question. And uh, we'll, how about we can uh, have a separate discussion on that? And Dr. Kumar, you can be the speaker and lead the discussion on that i i nominate you to maybe next week would you like to come and lead the discussion on what the origin and where are we going 
It's a very uh, deep no, uh, next next week is too soon. July maybe the earliest. Okay, let's let's schedule it for July. But I'll, I'll reach out. But, I'll contact. You. I will send you this paper. You are welcome to share with anybody. It's incredible how time has been defined, like thousands of years ago. Shocking. Okay, I'm looking forward to read that paper, and now I'm going to my questions. Okay, Doctor Hassad. Can you share a moment from your career that was particularly challenging while working on either Hubble or James Webb telescope and how you overcame it? So cha challenging is, yeah, there were very, very moments, but the one that really stands out most in my mind because it's, it's, it's a, it was an emotional moment also, was 9-11. Because that day, I was, you know, I was, uh, that time it was NGST, program scientist, and uh, this mid-infrared instrument that I've mentioned, we had, that had been very challenging, getting that instrument, you know, getting the Europeans and the, and the, Americans together to agree on what uh, part they would do. And so that whole thing, the whole process had been very, very challenging. And I was, you know, the NASA program scientist leading that. But once we had decided what, what part NASA would be doing and what part uh, uh, European would be doing, I was given the task that you go to the NASA centers and, uh, uh, you know, uh, headquarters told me that you organize a review and decide so that we can decide which NASA center will lead this instrument. So I had to actually write to, to the directors of Goddard and JPL and uh, uh, Ames, which were the three centers uh, who were interested in uh, working on MIRI. And then I organized a review and on 9-11, we were conducting that review. So, you know, every time I see a beautiful image from Miri, I remember that moment. And uh, we had, I think it was maybe like, and this was in a building, it was near headquarters, but it was really a very isolated room. We didn't know what was going on outside. It wasn't facing the road. And about 10 o'clock, the building uh, manager came and said, uh, to my boss, she's like, excuse me, I have to interrupt your meeting. You know, Ames, uh, scientist was in the middle of a presentation and he said, I have to interrupt you. And he said, you know, at that time they didn't know much. And he said that, you know, this plane has crashed. And uh, that time, you know, I think the plane had crashed uh, at uh, Pentagon. So people could see the fire, but they didn't know where it was. So he said, there's a fire at the White House and everything has been closed. Met metros, airports, everything are closed. Of course, everyone was very stunned. We stopped the meeting right there. First thing my boss said, <clears throat> the people from California <clears throat> had come with their luggage because they were planning to go to the airport after their presentations. She said, first thing, go and get your hotel reservations back. She called headquarters and again, you know, there was really not much. There was just so much confusion. And she said, um, th then she came back and she said, you know, the streets of DC are packed. Nobody can get out. Everyone is walking. So I think we'll just finish this uh, presentation and uh, leave after that. And I was using that time to try and contact my family and you know, all the cell phones were, were blocked. There, at that time, there weren't that many cell phone connections anyway. And it just happened that my husband who works for NIH, that particular day, he had come into DC because he had to, he was planning to go to India. So he had come to the Indian embassy to get a visa. So I couldn't get through to him either. But anyway, we finished this and then uh, um, I, yeah, and I was trying to call my son and nobody, then I managed to get through the daughter of one of my neighbors. And I said, you don't know, can you get in touch with my family? She said, what are you doing in DC? You must come home right now. So I said, you know, the metro is closed. As soon as the metro opens, I'll come. But can you come and pick me up from the metro stop? So we finished the, the Miri presentations, you know, not really knowing what had happened. 
And then afterwards, you know, once that was done, I came out and I had never seen DC like that streets, not a soul on the street. It was like, it was almost surreal because the weather was beautiful that day. I still remember it was an ideal uh, autumn day. So, so as I said, that was one a moment which really stands out in, in my mind as perhaps one of the most challenging ones to keep going despite such diversity. Thank you for sharing. I, I am sure it was uh, very emotional. I, I remember that day too. And yeah. uh, it's, I, I, I think all the work kind of both continued and stopped at the same time. And it, it was... Uh, on, it was surreal. I, I agree. Yeah. Okay. Going, continuing with my questions is um, uh, impact on science. What do you believe will be the most transformative discoveries that James Webb could achieve based on its current missions and capabilities? So uh, I'll answer this in two ways. One is what uh, you know, it will discover something we don't know about yet. And that's what I'm really waiting for. It's like when Hubble was launched, we didn't know there was dark energy out there. We didn't know there were exoplanets and Hubble did all this groundbreaking science of things we didn't know about. So that's what my greatest thing is. Uh, but then the other is, you know, seeing how the universe started and James Webb is already uh, turning, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, former uh, theories and findings up, upside on their heads, like one of the latest ones, I don't know if I showed you, was the merging of two black holes. Uh, how did these black holes come so early? How were they formed? And one was an early formation of galaxies. They uh, found that there's a lot of pristine hydrogen and helium around them, which makes one believe that, you know, that maybe the galaxy started forming much earlier. And we uh, earlier theories were that, you know, stars formed first and the galaxies. And now these galaxies, there are also newly born stars in them. So maybe the galaxies started forming early on and the stars formed inside the galaxies as they were happening. So these are few things which I think are really transport, transformative science uh, going on. And of course, exoplanets, we are just beginning to learn about. Lots and lots to discover, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And um, looking back at the journey from Hubble to James Webb, what do you consider your most significant achievement or contribution? So for for... Hubble, I think um, my most significant was actually the work on, on the, the optics. And I was told that I, you know, when the first servicing mission took place, they didn't give me leave to go home to India for my nephew's wedding. I'll never forget that but because it happened over Christmas. And so they said that you have to get the telescope in best focus before we can deploy CoStar. And so I had to keep analyzing the images as they send them to us. And uh, I feel proud that they, they, they said, we'll give you three chances to, to get it right. And I was really proud of myself that I, the first chance I got it right and they deployed CoStar earlier than they had thought they would. So that I think personally is my, uh, what I think is my greatest achievement. And then, you know, bringing my experiences to uh, JWST, and that you can't really pinpoint, but I, I think one of the lessons which NASA, uh, as, as an agency, uh, uh, used was to get to test the optics of JWST, because this was going to be at L2. We couldn't send a servicing mission there. So as all of you know, in Johnson, um, uh, the telescope was sent to uh, JSC, where uh, a special, you know, the Apollo time chamber was uh, <coughs> was uh, reconfigured to test uh, JWST. 
you know, I had the chance to meet James Webb in uh, at Johnson. Plus, I was also privileged to see the assembly at Goddard. So oh. I, I had a ch two chances to meet Great. James yeah. Webb instruments and uh, at different forms of the of of its uh, assembly life. So thank you. And future space exploration. So how, a couple of questions in that area. With the successful deployment of James Webb, what do you see as the next frontier for space telescopes? Are there any projects on the horizon that excites you? Yes, yeah, so we are, I usually put a backup slide on this. Um, as you know, we are now, uh, uh, building the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is uh, going, again, it's complementing uh, both uh, James Webb and uh, uh, and Hubble. So it's, uh, uh, so it, in that sense, it'll go beyond what James Webb and Hubble is going to do much bigger and deeper fields and much more science. So, okay, and, and uh, how, sorry, and I should also mention mm -hmm. that uh, the latest uh, decadal survey has recommended something which we are now calling the Habitable Worlds Observatory, which is really very much in the conceptual stage right now, and that is uh, to look for an Earth-like planet, exoplanet, exoplanets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, interesting that that's uh, we'll we'll follow up on that. How do you envision the role of international collaboration in the future of space telescopes and exploration? I, I think international uh, collaboration is really important. We are all seeking the same answers, and uh, clearly, all no individual nation has uh, the capability of doing what a partnership can produce. As we have demonstrated with many partnerships, and including James Webb and Hubble, I mean, we don't have a rocket the size that the French had, which launched this. Uh, the science, uh, the scientists, uh, and the instruments that they provided, everything, you know, Canada has provided this critical fine guidance sensor, which uh, points the telescope for us. So partnerships are very important. Thank you. And now in uh, the advice for aspiring scientists, what advice would you give to young scientists and engineers who aspire to contribute to projects like Hubble and James Webb? Well, um, scientists go, go to the archives, as, as I've said and do your science, whatever science you have in mind, you don't have to get uh, observing time. Now, of course you can go and uh, apply for observing time on both Hubble and Webb, but you don't have to get observing time. The data is already there and you can uh, pull it out and analyze it. So I would say start there and then as you progress, submit your own proposals to Hubble and Webb. Uh, the engineers, uh, that's not really my field, but I would say the engineers can look at, at the groundbreaking te technology that was developed uh, uh, for James Webb. And similarly for Hubble, I mean, more, a lot of the technology on Hubble is from the 70s. It's still working. Maybe there are some lessons to be learned there. How, how do you develop technology that will last for such a long time? Thank you. As I mentioned before in our previous conversation that we do have a high school student that attends our meetings and uh, interested in uh, exoplanets and studying that field. So thank you for your view on what and where to start. With this, based on your experience, what skills and qualities do you think are essential for success in space research and exploration? Well, first of all, you have to have the enthusiasm and desire to do that. And then of course, if you want to be a scientist, you do need that scientific background. 
Uh, you don't necessarily have to have a PhD, but you have to have a certain level of uh, uh, science and uh, uh, mathematics behind it. N know the basic physics and mathematics. Now, I didn't do a degree in astronomy, but I did have a degree in physics. And so once you know the basic physics and math, uh, you can uh, certainly uh, learn astronomy. And similarly for engineers, you have to have your basic engineering uh, degree and or at least the knowledge of the engineering degree. I do know of engineers who don't have a degree, but they have worked in that field long enough that they have gained the knowledge that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Very insightful. So a couple more questions that I see came from uh, among the thanking you for being appearing on our platform and uh, having this incredible story that you're shared, both uh, the about Hubble and uh, James Webb, as well as your your uh, the story about uh, the the, um, the September 11. And uh, Rock asked, what is your opinion on proposed, no, it's not that, sorry, I am I already asked that one. What is a space telescope you wished it would have already selected, developed, and launched? Okay, if, if you'll give me, let me interrupt you for a second, sure. I'd like to show you this slide on uh, on Nancy Grace Roman. Oh, absolutely, yes. Uh, okay, here it is. So here, here's a slide I prepared for another talk, which compares uh, Hubble, Roman, and Webb. So on the top, you see Hubble, Roman, and Webb, and you can see the field of view of Hubble and of web and then Roman, which is uh, the wide field imager, that's the biggest field of view. So uh, in one line, Hubble views the cosmos in infrared visible ultraviolet, providing high resolution view of individual objects. Uh, web con also conducts high resolution infrared peering across fast st stretches of time with a narrower field of view than Roman. And, and the Roman telescope will expand on Hubble's infrared observation, specifically using a much larger field of view to create enormous paran <coughs> sorry, paranormas of the universe with the same higher resolution. So the bigger picture with the Roman telescope, it will see planets by the thousands, stars by the billions, galaxies by the millions, fundamental physics, and of course, the unexpected. And here you can see the Hubble field of view, how tiny it is compared to the Roman field of view. So I'll stop there, but uh, it was tempting to. Wow, it, it's definitely the, the contrast between the, the, the field of view is uh, just enormous. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for demonstrating that. Okay. okay. The next so question was that... about right Which, that what space telescope you wish that would have already been selected developed and launched oh dear i wish all of them had been selected probably nancy gray <laughs> I, I don't think i can choose amongst my children they are all beautiful <laughs> but I, I think i am pretty excited both about roman and the habitable world observatory which is as I said, still in the conceptual stage. So we have to see what we eventually come up with. I, I think that's a pretty exciting one. Awesome. And uh, I think this one kind of relates to a previously asked question. How does collaboration between different missions, for example, DART, Asteroid Impact, Hubble Telescope, and uh, James Webb work? What team reaches out first to others? So I, I do not know what they mean um, by collaboration, but uh, if if you're talking about, uh, you know, these are all missions which have been launched already. So if you are looking uh, uh, for, I, I think uh, when, when the- I can expand on the question, yeah. Hubble, 
Sorry? So, so the question, uh, what I meant was, for example, when the DART impacted the asteroid, right? Uh, the NASA also used the uh, Hubble and Webb to observe the uh, the outcome of the impact itself. So how do you schedule those interactions between the missions? Yeah. In fact, I was just going to say that, that, for example, when the DART impact came, both Hubble and JWST were, were turned on to that. And, and that, I think, happens for, for most of the important ones. And I'm not 100% sure how that coordination takes place, whether... Uh, but whether it takes place at the level of NASA headquarters probably does. I suspect that uh, the teams talk with the with a program scientist and say that what we are going to do, or they might talk directly to the uh, director of Space Telescope Science Institute because they are responsible for the science of Hubble and JWST. But I, I, I'm not really sure what process is followed. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, it's probably above uh, above the level uh, or a few levels on uh, the coordination and uh, most likely some sort of a... Uh, but, but when we are looking for parallel... Advisory. Yeah, when we're looking for parallel observations, that, that's why I didn't know what level he was looking at because we do have parallel observations between, you know, so different... Uh, uh, what we call time, time allocation committees on, on the different observing programs, they are permitted to give out time on, on another observatory if there's a partnership between the two. So, so, for example, let me tell you about New Star, which I'm responsible for. So New Star, when, when the CRISM uh, uh, was going to be launched, CRISM wanted uh, some time on New Star for New Star to, to make some observations uh, of, to, to help in the calibration of PRISM. So, so they came to us and, you know, program scientists and said, the program scientists for PRISM came to me and said that, you know, we want to do this. So I spoke with the project scientists at Goddard and, and then the New Star PIs, uh, we did a, a memorandum of understanding between the two missions. And then we put it in a observing uh, call that we now have parallel time between. And so that's how we do with, with a lot of missions. If you go and look at our observing calls, you will see sometimes that New Star has observing time in parallel with maybe NICER or XP or something like that. And similarly, XP has and Hubble and JWST have and so on. Yeah, lots of lots of collaboration starts with first defining memorandum of understanding, MOUs. And well, thank you so much for all the insightful information. I think we have exhausted questions, at least for regarding today's presentation. And I also appreciate your time that you spent with us. It uh, came, went out, went a little bit longer than we normally have our meetings, which I still appreciate. And uh, wanted to express our gratitude and welcome you for our future meetings. And uh, Svetlana, yes, I'm waiting for the email. I am so I'm like a little baby. As soon as I get the email, I'll shoot my tape. I I will send you email. I, I'm right now concentrating on this meeting. So if you can wait a little bit after I close the meeting, that would be great. And uh, so thanks, uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. You are welcome to join us every Saturday. We meet at 8.30 in the morning. You have a link. You are welcome to join us every Saturday. And uh, some Saturdays we have speakers. And like today, Dr. Kumar volunteered. So he will be leading our discussion on the, 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 the time and definition of time and the before the time. And uh, so that's going to be a quite philosophical and I'm looking forward to that in July. And uh, I will keep you uh, uh, appraised and uh, in the know on uh, what other speakers we have in future. So with this, Dr. Hassan and everybody else, thank you for joining. And I'm looking forward to our interaction in future. Have a great weekend. And remember, it is a Memorial Day, so we have to think about those that are uh, have defended our freedom on uh, on Monday there will be a moment of silence and three at 3 p.m I believe 
And so that's uh, the time to remember that outside of all the all the grilling and celebrating, meeting your friends and maybe perhaps taking trips to uh, other places, remember why we are able to do that. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Great you. presentation. Thank you.